tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener to the horror hill. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow you. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself if you dare. Come, inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 15. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. In tonight's episode, we have a very special tale from that master of horrific hilarity, Kevin David Anderson. In it, we join my two favorite monster-hunting truckers, Dale and Earl, pinned down in a hospital overrun by the undead in a heroic struggle to lead the survivors to safety, not realizing the true danger may be closer than they think. <laughs> You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, Visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life, where those who seek the darkness need look no further. Welcome listener to the horror hill you haven't found the darkness the darkness has found you now that i've got your attention it's time to hop in rev the engine and buckle up because this big rig is in for a long haul of pure terror Without further ado, from author Kevin David Anderson, I give you the greatest fear. What the hell's eating you? Dale said while pushing the desk up against the barricade. You're more irritable than a defanged rattlesnake. Earl grabbed an oversized chair and carried it to the desk. I just had my fingers sewn back on. Ain't that reason enough? No. I mean, before that. And don't act like it's the first time you've had an appendage reattached. Dale reached for an end table. Last couple of days, you've been pissing and moaning about something or other. Earl pulled out his knife, an ungodly-looking Bowie-style blade named Betsy. I guess it's the thing with my nephew. With lightning speed, Earl slashed off the undead fingers that were trying to pry the door open. There was a moan as the detached digits bounced down the barricade of office furniture, like stones in a rock slide. Little Jojo? Dale piled on the end table. Yeah, but he ain't. 
To Earl's right, the glass began to crack. Pressure from the corpses pushing inward was starting to have an effect. The office window that looked out into the hospital hallway fractured. Thin, spiderweb-sized cracks streaked down the center as dead faces and hands pressed against the outside. Earl sighed at the ugliness on the other side of the glass, then reached over and pulled the blind shut. That's probably not going to cut it, Dale said, looking around for something to board up the window. Jesus, we're going to die, shouted Mr. Kanye, the hospital administrator, who, earlier in the day, wouldn't accept Earl's insurance. He huddled to the floor of his office as far away from the door as possible, along with three hospital employees in different colored scrubs, a woman in street clothes, and an elderly woman in a wheelchair. Oh, calm down, Dale said, moving toward a coffee table. Don't tell me to calm down. This is my office, and you are not in charge here. No, sir, I am not, Dale said, lifting the table, then moving to the window. But it doesn't help the situation to lose your head. Best way to get through this is to stay calm. That's true enough, Earl added. You'd be surprised what Dale and I have managed to survive just by keeping cool. Earl helped Dale slap the coffee table against the window. Oh, bullshit, Mr. Kanye said. Neither one of you know what you're doing or what is going on. As Earl dragged a faux leather love seat over to prop against the coffee table, Dale looked back at the panicking administrator. He grinned, knowing that the moment in which he would be required to bitch slap Mr. Kanye was not too far off. He told himself he wasn't going to do or say anything to hurry the moment along, just stay polite, calm. But when it did come, he knew most distinctly that he would enjoy it. True enough, Earl said as the glass finally gave way. Hands pushed through the gaps that the coffee table did not cover. Glass hung down like teeth on a jack-o'-lantern, cutting into unflinching dead flesh. Earl hacked at a few splitting the palms down the middle, letting each half hang on either side of a useless bony wrist. Dale turned to Earl. What thing with your nephew? Earl wiped the blood from Betsy on the loveseat cushion. Oh, I just got his invite in the mail. Jojo is... Somebody needs to do something! Mr. Kanye shouted. He jumped to his feet and moved toward the barricade Dale and Earl had constructed. For a brief moment, Dale thought Mr. Kanye was coming to help. Seeing as how his tiny group of survivors hadn't offered to lift a finger thus far to help secure the room or fight off the undead, it would have been a nice change. Up till now, they mostly whimpered. Some cried or cowered on the floor, which Dale didn't mind a whole lot. It made it easier to order them around, get them to move, keep them alive for as long as there was sufficient reason to. But now Mr. Kanye was up, moving purposefully his paisley tie flapping around his sizable belly as he moved. Dale was about to tell him where he could help as he and Earl had both sets of hands on the barricade, but in a flash of disappointment, Dale realized the hospital administrator was not rising to their aid, but was on a mission of his own. He pulled a key from his pocket and quickly stuck it in the keyhole of the desk drawer, the same desk Dale and Earl had slid up against the door without anyone's help. He wrenched the drawer open so fast it almost fell to the floor. Mr. Kanye retrieved a pistol, a hammerless revolver, and immediately pointed it at the window. Without any hesitation or aim, Mr. Kanye fired. The bullet went through the coffee table, missing Earl's hand by inches. Dale grinned. The bitch-slapping moment had arrived. Mr. Kanye fired again as Dale quick-stepped to the side, spun on a booted heel, then brought up a practiced hand. But before he could bring it down in what would have been a most satisfying blow, a lamp slammed into the back of Mr. Kanye's head. His out-of-shape form went limp, and then dropped like a weighted body tossed off a pier. Dale looked at the crumpled pile on the floor. God damn it! Don't you mean thank you? said the woman wearing street clothes who had just put down Mr. Kanye. Oh, yeah, that too, Dale said, trying not to sound disappointed. I could use a hand or two over here, Earl said. Dale snatched the pistol up, identified it, Smith & Wesson, M&P, 640, then moved back to the window. A dead face pushed its way through a gap, 
glass cutting into the cheek deep enough to expose bone. Dale placed the muzzle on its forehead and fired. Damn it! Earl shouted, stepping away from the window. I said more hands, not gunfire! Sorry, Dale said, realizing he had fired the revolver a little too close to his head. Another walking corpse filled in the spot at the window Dale had just cleared. This one was naked, but shuffled oddly, as if the body bag it had been in was now crumpled and dragging around its ankles like an oversized pair of pants. Dale stuck the pistol deep into its mouth, attempting to muffle the blast a little. Dale fired and blew out the back of its neck. The head snapped back like it had taken a baseball bat to the face. The corpse fell away. A few hands rose to take its place, but no more faces. Dale wondered if they were learning. The dead, for the moment, staggered back a bit and gave the barricade some breathing room. He turned to check on his friend. Earl had a finger in his ear and seemed to be massaging it. Hearing bells? Dale said. Ring-a-ding-a-ding-ding, Earl said. Put that away before you make me deaf. Dale tucked the pistol away as the woman who had wielded the lamp held out her hand. I'm Hannah, she said, and that's me, Ma, over there. She gestured to the octogenarian in the wheelchair. Afraid I don't know these other folks. Oh, it's all right, Dale said, looking over at the hospital employees. One male, two female. Can one of you check on our hero here? The employees looked at one another for a few indecisive moments. Then a heavy-set Asian woman in blue scrubs started to get up. She used the armrest of the wheelchair to steady herself as she rose. The old woman occupying the chair didn't try to hide her disgust. She moved her hand and leaned away so she wouldn't have to come in contact with the nurse, and Dale swore he could see loathing in the old crone's eyes. I'm Kathy, the nurse said, kneeling down to check Mr. Kanye's vitals. Will he, uh, live, Kathy? Earl said. She nodded, then helped Mr. Kanye into a sitting position. His eyes fluttered and he reached for his head. Blood dripped down the back of his hairless scalp, and as he touched it, anger flashed across his face. Dale was pretty sure Mr. Kanye was about to start spouting off again, and he thought he'd nip it in the bud. He hunkered down in front of the hospital administrator, close enough to get a deep inhalation of his musky cologne, and took a fistful of his silk tie. Dale pulled him close. Mr. Kanye reached up with one hand and touched it to Dale's forehead, a forearm that was as thick as a brick and as soft to the touch as a cinder block. In an instant, Kanye's anger melted away. The sweat glistened on his forehead. Now listen up, pencil dick. You do anything that stupid, something that puts me or my friend in danger again. And I'm going to put you on the other side of that window. Dale paused to make sure it was sinking in. Do we understand one another? Mr. Kanye nodded enthusiastically. And to revise my earlier answer, Dale added, Yes, I am in charge. Why? Hannah said. Because you have the gun? Dale stood up slowly, feeling extremely underappreciated. No, not because I have the gun, but that is normally a pretty good reason. Well, why then? Because my friend and I know a thing or two about a thing or two. Do you? Dale said, realizing he sort of sounded like Dr. Seuss in an insurance commercial. Anna didn't respond, uncertainty on her face. If it makes you feel better, Dale removed the pistol from his belt and held it out to Hannah. She stared down at it, clearly debating the situation. Before she made up her mind, the male orderly stepped forward and took the gun from Dale. Dale looked at the tall, beefy man in salmon-colored scrubs. You know how to handle that? Eight years in the army, two of them on the DMZ, he said, tumbling out the carousel to eye the ammo. Well, that's all we need up in here, Hannah's grandma said. A spear chucker with a gun. Meemaw, Hannah scolded. We talked about using that kind of language in front of the... The orderly looked up from the gun and turned to meet Hannah's uncomfortable gaze. In front of the what? Hannah swallowed. The, um... The people. All the people in... The 
public, generally. The orderly aimed his brown eyes at the woman in the wheelchair. Yo, Mima! My name is Dwayne. Feel free to use it. You can also feel free to roll your own ass around from now on. Dale put a hand on Dwayne. Let's just calm down a minute. Dwayne pulled his arm away. Get your redneck hands off me! Dale felt a burst of anger radiate from his chest to his fist, but he smacked his lips and did his best to ignore the impulse to act on it. With a deep breath, he transferred the angry energy into a smile, which he had been practicing with Earl's encouragement, one he hoped was not too creepy, but at the same time sent the message that he was not one to be pushed around. Now, Dwayne, Dale said, I'm going to let you have that one. He held up a finger. But just that one. Temperatures are all running a bit hot right now, and that is reasonable. But we're all in this together, and for the time being, we are stuck with one another. So, let's stay civil. Am I being understood? Dwayne's eyes seemed to register that he knew he'd push Dale as far as was safe, and he nodded, slowly, calmly. Okay, Hannah said clearly happy that the focus was not on her anymore. What's the plan? Dale nodded. If I may consult with my larger half here, and I'll get back to you. In the meantime, everybody relax. Be civil. Dale didn't pause to see if anyone had suddenly decided to ignore all their instincts by relaxing and stepped over to Earl. So, what do you think? Keeping one hand on the barricade, Earl said, Well... I think me, Ma, might be a racist. Reached that conclusion all by yourself, did you? Dale said. Hey, I'll pay attention. Dale pushed up against the barricade. Yeah, definitely a few tiki torches in her closet. You get a holler back yet from those a-holes in gray? Not yet, Dale said. He reached down and picked up the receiver on Kanye's office phone that somehow managed to stay on the desk during the hasty relocation. He listened for a dial tone, checked several lines. Nothing. Hardline communications around, so we know they're on site. Assholes. Dale pulled his smartphone from his inside leather vest pocket. No signal. And they've taken out the towers. How are they going to hit you back? Well, I got a message through before it went dark. If they want to holler at me, they can. I just can't call out. That's part of the protocol, Dale said. Shit. Probably was my call that got us stuck in here. Dumb dumb. Well, at least you're pretty, Dale snickered. So, what were you saying about your nephew? Earl looked like he just remembered he forgot to take the garbage out. I got his invite the other day. Invite? Jojo is getting... He's getting gay married. Earl, it's not gay married, it's just married. Earl shook his head like someone who had just stepped into place a dog had done his business. I know, I know. I don't mean to sound like a jackass. Dale's phone rang, to be continued. Dale here. An overworked female voice said, Hold for Captain Major. Yep, Dale said, then pulled the phone away from his ear. Getting married, huh? Earl nodded. Seems like only yesterday I was bouncing him on my knee and building him that kid-sized kitchenette. I had a real microwave and all, you know? I know, you roped me into helping you. That boy could make the best muffins on the reservation by age six. Dale, Captain Major here, came a deep stoic voice from the phone. What's your situation? Well, I think you know my situation, Dale said. I am stuck in here, smack dab in the middle of your quarantine zone. I am very sorry to hear that. Earl in there as well? Yeah, his luck tends to run parallel with mine, Dale confirmed. He sliced his finger to the bone on a hitch this morning when we were switching up trailers. Took near half a day to get it sewed up proper. Swear we were almost ready to leave when all hell broke loose. Did the rising originate from inside or outside the facility? Well, I'm pretty sure it came from inside. The morgue's downstairs and I'm guessing it was pretty full. As you probably already know, this hospital's morgue serves as several counties' Grand Central Station for the dead. 
Earl said he saw a few rise in the ICU, but we're pretty sure most came up from the morgue. Are you 100% certain on the point of origin? Captain, I'm not 100% on anything other than we are up a creek at the moment and all the paddles want to kill us, including you, Dale said. Dale, we're going to do all we can to get you. Don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining, Dale said. I know MIG protocols. I know you're following them. But I got to let you know, Captain, there is something odd about this particular rising. I can't as of yet put my finger on it, but there's something wrong with this one. I, I concur. Our lab has identified some abnormalities. We obtained two samples from the infected hospital, one from the parking lot, another from the maternity ward. It had eaten its way through some of the infants before we secured it. Dale hated how Captain Major could discuss the most horrific of details with clinical and utter desensitization. Though clearly deceased, he continued, neither sample contained any of the known pathogens, indigenous or otherwise, known to raise the dead. We also tested for trioxin and all other known toxins. All negative. Dale knew it was a long shot, but he took his best swing anyway. Well, then we're dealing with something that is outside MIG protocols. You have containment, and I didn't spy more than 20 or 30, give or take. You can contain this. Cleansing is not necessary. Our spotters put the number of reanimates at 43, and you know that the lack of a known cause does not negate the necessity to cleanse the zone. We have protocols for situations that fall outside of protocols. Of course you do. Dale felt like he was talking to a damn recording. Just tell me it wasn't my call that got us trapped in here. Captain Major didn't respond. Crap on a cracker, Dale said. All right, when do you go? At dawn, Captain Major said. Give us... Mm, we need daylight for damage assessment. Dale looked at his watch. That gave them about three and a half hours to figure something out. Again, I am sorry, Dale, Captain Major said. Can I pass a message to Velma and your boy? Dale ended the call. It wasn't that he didn't have anything to say to Velma and his son. He just couldn't imagine his last words to them being delivered by an ex-military pencil neck MIG agent who had all the warmth of a dead jellyfish. A hand reached through the broken office window and grabbed Earl's wrist. Give it to me straight, Earl said, twisting his hand free from the undead grasp then swung Betsy, cutting off the offending attacker's appendage to the wrist. How are we doing? Our usual, Dale said, nudging the severed hand on the floor with his foot. We got three hours. Hell, that's just ducky. What do you want to tell them? Earl nodded toward the small group on the other side of the office. No point in sugarcoating it. Just need a minute to gather my thoughts and I'll figure out how to phrase it. Dale leaned up against the barricade. So... What you got against Jojo getting married? Earl held up his hands in surrender. Nothing. Nothing at all. Hell, his family's okay with it. The tribe is okay with it. Why can't you be? I am. I swear, I just... I feel for him, you know? All the extra crap he had and his partner will have to put up with. The judgment. The bullshit. Dale put a hand on his friend's shoulder. Well, he's got you to protect him from the world of assholes. Besides, it ain't like when you were his age. Things have changed. More people believe that folks' internal wiring about who we want to be with is sent by the powers of be. Hell, you think I'd be attracted to Velma if I had a choice in the matter? I am wired for crazy. It ain't no choice. Not everybody believes that, Duane said, stepping over toward the barricade. Hey, man, private conversation over here, Dale said. Dwayne grimaced. There's eight people trapped in a one-room office. There are no private conversations, Dale nodded. Well, fair enough. My sister's gay, Dwayne said. My Baptist parents spent a lot of money trying to fix her at those pray-the-gay-away camps. Didn't work. And now, no one in the family speaks to her anymore, especially after she announced she was getting gay married. It's not gay married, Earl said. It's just married. Whatever you call it, Dwayne said. They're hard to get cakes for. He turned to Dale. Now, 
you're going to tell us what that call was about, and how it is that you can even get calls when none of our phones can get the signal. Dale looked around the moderately sized office and absorbed the fact that everyone had been listening. Okay, here's the situation. We're in a Class A quarantine zone that has been deemed unrecoverable. What does that mean, unrecoverable? Kathy said, standing up. Dale took a deep breath. It means that around sunup, those keeping us inside will retreat to a safe zone and a low-yield nuclear device will be dropped on this facility. How does that help us? Kathy said. If they're keeping us... Uh... Her words trailed off as the cold realization clearly hit her. She fell back against the wall, and the other nurse, a very senior-looking Hispanic woman, took her hand. Let me talk to them, Mr. Kanye said, holding out his hand. Dale stared at the chief administrator. There's nothing you can say that will sway them. The mayor is a good friend of mine. If I can talk to him... Won't make any difference, Earl said. Once MIG decides to cleanse, it's game over. Oh, just give him the goddamn phone, Kathy shouted. Except for the clawing at the door, the room fell silent. All eyes fell on Kathy, visibly shaking. The awkward silence was broken by a cackle. The old woman shifted in her wheelchair and said, You gonna let a gook talk to you like that? Meemaw, Hannah said. Please behave. Yeah, Meemaw, Dwayne said. Do yourself a favor and shut the fuck up. Meemaw looked away from the scowls in the room and started mumbling under her breath. Her incoherent rambling reminded Dale of those old Popeye cartoons he'd seen as a kid. Dale never knew what the old sailor was saying under his breath, but even as a kid he could tell it was salty. Mr. Kanye held his hand out to Dale again. Dale slapped the phone into his palm. It won't call out. If they want to talk to us, it'll ring. Clearly not believing Dale, Mr. Kanye continued to try and get the smartphone to work. He even held it up to the light like a cashier checking for counterfeit bills. What an idiot. Who the hell's M.I.G.? Dwayne said. The government? Dale shook his head. It's more like a black ops arm of the WHO. The what? World Health Organization, Kathy said. And they're going to kill us? Well, a race us is more like it, Earl said. When they're done, no one will even remember this place. Or us. Earl, Dale said with a glare. Earl lowered his voice. Well, you said not to sugarcoat it. A little sugar never hurt anybody, Dale murmured. Okay, listen up. We got about three hours to get as far away from this hospital as possible. I haven't met a quarantine zone I couldn't get in or out of. So let's take a look at where... How many quarantine zones have you been inside of? Dwayne said. Mm, counting this one? Dwayne nodded. Um, one? Dwayne threw up his hand and spun away. I'm just trying to stay positive. I'm familiar with quarantine protocols, and if anyone is going to find a hole in them, it's me. So, the air is covered, supported by Chinooks running silent. The main exits, windows on the first and second floor, should be sealed up by now. You thinking about shimmying down a third store window? Earl said, gesturing to Meemaw's chair. Cause that'll be fun. How about underground? Said the nurse who hadn't yet spoken. She stepped away from the wall. Dale guessed her to be in her sixties. Her once black hair had only a remnant of its former glory, now fading into thick strands of gray. Dark lines in her skin were carved deep into a Latin complexion. What's your name? Dale said. Maria. Ha! Typical. Half their women are named Maria. The old woman hissed. Maria! I just met a girl named Maria! Hannah bent down and got in her face. Stop it, Mima! Right now! Mima waved a dismissive hand, then went back to mumbling under her breath. Go on, Maria, Earl said. There are tunnels into the hospital. That's right, Dwayne said. Steam tunnels, I think. But they're closed. Have been for a long time, Maria said. They're not that closed, Dwayne said. Dale turned his attention to Dwayne. What do you mean? Dwayne looked over at Mr. Kanye. Certain employees go down there from time to time to partake in some relaxing activities. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll? 
Mm, sex, drugs, not so much rock and roll. More Barry White and Lou Rawls. Mm, little Snoop Dogg. That area is off limits, Mr. Kanye chimed in. Are you admitting to participating in these activities, Dwayne? I'm not admitting to anything, Dwayne said. I just want to get the fuck out of here. As do we all, Earl said. Mr. Kanye, if and we're all alive tomorrow, feel free to write Dwayne up. But at the moment, we got some bigger fish to fry. A steam tunnel isn't going to take us much farther than the property, which might get us under the quarantine in the immediate area, but we'd still have to cover a lot of ground on the surface, Dale said. Mr. Kanye wiped sweat from his forehead. The tunnels go further than the property. Much further. How do you know this? Dale said. Um, part of the county's new emergency evacuation plan. They're expanding the tunnel to evacuate patients in case of a flood. The hospital is less than a mile from the major waterway, which makes this a flood zone. They want patients to be evacuated underground during a flood, Earl said. That sounds about as smart as scuba diving in quicksand. Kanye shook his head, obviously flummoxed. Not just flood, tornado, earthquake, any natural disaster. How come we haven't heard about any of this? Kathy said. Do you attend town meetings? Kanye said. No, Kathy said. Then don't act surprised when you don't know what's going on. Dale was pretty fair at smelling lies, but he didn't need to be to smell the line of bullshit Kanye had just pulled from his ass. He didn't know why he was lying, but he also didn't have the time to look a gift horse in the mouth. It didn't matter why the tunnel was there, as long as it was really there. How far does it go? Dale said. Far enough, Kanye said. Dale looked over at Earl. What do you say, old man? Earl shrugged. Feels like we're about to jump off a cliff into an itty-bitty stream and I can't swim. Dale slapped a hand onto Earl's shoulder. No matter. The fall will probably kill us. Dale turned to Kanye. So, where's the entrance to this tunnel? Kanye didn't answer, and Dale glanced over at Kathy and saw dread on her face. Far end of the hospital. Downstairs, Maria said. In the morgue. Well, that's just ducky. Earl said. How far? Dale said. A hundred yards, give or take, Dwayne said. We'll never make it, Mr. Kanye said. We're better off staying here. In case you've forgotten recent events, Dale said, there will be no here in less than three hours. Staying is not an option. We can make it, Earl said. Hell, there ain't that many of them. Dale looked at his friend as if to say, You sure? Earl shrugged. Okay, Dale said, slapping his hands together. We're making a run for it. Kathy said, but What if the tunnel is locked or doesn't go far enough, or, or we get lost down there, or... One catastrophe at a time, please, Dale said. We'll pole vault those hornet nests when they sting us in the ass. What? Dwayne said. <sighs> Never mind, Dale said. For those of you that don't have a gun, find yourself a weapon. Like what? Maria said. Chair leg, lamp, paperweight, scissors, Earl said. There's lots of stuff in here. Hell, Mr. Kanye's cologne is strong enough to put the dead off. Hold on, Mr. Kanye said. He stepped over to a closet and opened the door. He reached in and dragged out a full set of golf clubs. Excitement glinted in Earl's eyes. Now we're talking. Golf is my game. You hate golf, Dale said. Earl stepped over to the bag, pulled out a nine iron, and took a practice swing. Yep, yeah, that's because I never played full contact golf before. Hit. <laughs> All right, Dale lifted a driver from the bag. Grab a club and then step over to the door. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by Raycon. As a professional voice actor and dabbler in the recording arts, I can be a bit of a snob about what earbuds I use, which is why I'd like to talk to you about Raycon. There's no reason why you don't deserve the highest quality audio, whether working from home or working on your fitness. 
where you want what you're listening to to be what you're listening to, not what your children, your neighbor, or the gym rat a few machines down is listening to. Everyone needs a great pair of wireless earbuds. But before you go dropping hundreds of dollars in a pair, you need to check out the wireless earbuds from Raycon. You already know Raycon earbuds start at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market, and that they sound just as amazing as other top audio brands you know. And Raycon earbuds are so comfortable, if not for the optimal audio quality, you'd barely remember you were wearing earbuds. Perfect for conference calls, gaming, or binging podcasts. Their newest model, the E25 earbuds, are their best ones yet. With six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice, noise-isolating fit. I personally find the clear and precise audio quality to be perfect for sound editing, and frequently use my Raycon earbuds when reviewing narrations. So what are you waiting for? Now's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. Get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash hill. That's buyraycon.com slash hill for 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash hill. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. A small group of survivors single filed to the bag, except for Duane. Hannah grabbed a sand wedge and gave it to her grandmother, setting it in her lap. The old woman pushed it away and let it fall to the floor, clearly unwilling to defend herself. Mr. Kanye picked up and stroked it as if it were a long-lost pet. He gently returned it to the bag and took out a five iron. Okay, Earl and I will go out first and clear the doorway. Then, once we start moving, We'll pair up to watch each other's back. Earl and Dwayne will take point and clear as they go. Why the hell am I up front? Dwayne said. You wanted the gun, and you know the way, Dale said. No worries, Earl said. You lead and I'll watch you back like fleas and a dog. Just try not to shoot me. No promises. All right, Kathy and Maria follow Earl and Dwayne. Then Hannah and Meemaw behind them. Dale looked over at Mr. Kanye, cradling his club to his chest. Then you and I will bring up the rear. Kanye swallowed, then nodded. We move fast, we move together. We watch each other's butts. Dwayne, lead us straight to the morgue. Fastest way possible. No stops at the gift shop. Any questions? Dale glanced around at scared, uncertain faces. It was good to bet that they were not all going to make it. In fact, in these kinds of situations... It was almost necessary that some don't. The fallen often provide a needed escape window. How does that old joke go? You don't really need to outrun the bear. Dale just wished he could pick who would stumble and fall and who would benefit from the time-delaying sacrifice. He wasn't the type to encourage those kinds of outcomes. But if he were... No one helped Earl and Dale take down the barricade, not surprising since no one had helped them put it up. When the door was clear, Dale put his hand on the handle, and Earl stepped over to the still partially covered window. He peeked out. How are we looking? Dale said. Well, most of the ugliness is over here by the window. Earl waved playfully at the dead. Looks like we have four to deal with. Three are making googly eyes at me, and one's at the door. It seems to be teetering. If you wait ten seconds, I think its back will be to you. Dale looked back at the room full of survivors, most holding a club to their chest as if it were a life preserver. Dale only hoped that when the time came, they'd use them instead of just hug them. Be ready, Dale said. When we say move, beat your feet. Anyone that doesn't gets left behind. There were a few nods, one grimace, and a lot of trembling hands. Dale wished he had something inspiring to say like his high school coach would at halftime when he knew damn well they had to go back out on the field and take a beating. Now, Earl said. Dale pulled the door open and was immediately presented with an ass, bare, sagging, and way too hairy wrinkled for his liking. Hospital gowns flatter nobody, not even the dead. 
He swung the club down and buried the head of it into the back of the blonde hair covered skull. Its knees buckled and it fell forward into the wall, but it didn't go down. Its hand slapped on the wall and it started to push itself up. Dale yanked his club back, but it was hung up on the broken edges of the skull. Gray matter and bodily fluid started to spill down the rear of the hospital gown, changing its color from hazy white to a gooey mix of black and chunky crimson. He put his boot on the corpse's back to pull the club free. He drew back too hard and fell off balance, stumbling toward Kanye's office door. He whirled around, hoping the corpse was on the floor. It wasn't. The corpse took steps, trying to move forward, but... Since it was nose to paint with the wall, it wasn't making a lot of progress. Dale felt Earl move behind him. He just caught the glint of Betsy as Earl went to work on the walking corpses still clawing at the window. They didn't lunge at Earl, just kept pushing on the glass. Earl grabbed the nearest one by the scalp and pulled it back into Betsy. The large bowie knife sunk into the corpse's spine, cutting into the cervical vertebra. Earl twisted with his characteristic kill move severing nerve, muscle, sinew, and bone. The body went limp, but remained standing until Herb let go of the scalp. With one crumpled at his feet, Earl moved to the next. Dale was torn between helping Earl and keeping an eye on the one with an open skull trying to walk through the wall. Earl stuck Betsy into a temple, and to Dale's mind, Earl seemed to have his business in hand. Dale turned back to his corpse at the wall. He was going to take another swing at its head, but had the strangest urge to look into its eyes. He grabbed the loose fabric on its shoulder and whirled it around, discovering that it was female. Or had been. Besides its sex, Dale noticed that her eyes didn't seem right. They were sunk deep into her head. Not a facial feature, Dale concluded, but because her cranial area had been opened up, releasing internal pressure and matter, causing a slight tug from the optic nerve toward the rear. It was times like these when Dale wished he hadn't been so intensely schooled in human anatomy. But, as dislocated as the eyes looked, it wasn't where they were setting that bothered him about the eyes. It was their intensity. The carnivorous undead tended to have a vacancy to them that was unquestionably the product of instinct and need. But these eyes had spark. Dale didn't want to call it life, but there was something and Dale got the unshakable feeling that something alive was looking at him. It may not have been the former owner of this dead woman's body, but something, someone, was glaring at him. Shaking off the feeling, Dale swung the club again, forcing the body to the ground. Before it tried to get up, Dale brought his boot down on its head, crushing what was left of the skull. He put too much force into it, and he lost his footing on the slick, glazed floor. Earl seized his shoulder and pulled him upright. Thanks, Dale said, glancing around. Except for the two girthy truckers, nothing moved. He looked at the three still corpses under the hall window. Doesn't appear that I'm doing my fair share of the work. Yeah, you're about as useful as a steering wheel on a mule. It's been a long day. And I did get one. Don't exert yourself. You need to take a sit down? Dale shook his head and pointed to Earl's pile under the window. You uh, notice anything odd about those three? Just that they didn't seem all that interested in eating me, Earl said. Not sure if I should be relieved or insulted. Dale lowered his voice and patted Earl's belly. Maybe they just didn't have that big an appetite. Fat jokes, Earl said. Funny. You think maybe it's time you looked into getting some new material? I'll put it on my to-do list, Dale said, and started to walk down the wide hospital hall motioning Earl to follow. They tiptoed down the hall and glanced around the first corner. Twenty yards down the hall, an elderly zombie, its back to them, crouched over a very dead hospital security guard, laying in the center of the passage. The dead security guard's skin was very dark, and the whites of his eyes, open, frozen in horror, were a haunting contrast. They walked back to the office. Dale glanced in. None of them had moved. Not even Dwayne. They huddled against the wall farthest from the open door. You are sure you want to be in the caboose with that pencil pusher? Earl asked. It really makes my ass itch. Me too, but if somebody has to be thrown off the train, I think I'm the best man for that job. Hey, that reminds me. 
Earl said, a little too loud. Guess who Jojo asked to be his best man? You? Sure enough, Earl said. Imagine that. Me. The best man. The balance in my imagination is occupied picturing you in a tuxedo. Not that hard to imagine, Earl said, looking down at his belly, then immediately trying to suck it in. An attempt that was scarcely noticeable. Dale motioned to the survivors. Time to go. Everyone stay with their apocalypse, buddy. Dwayne was out first. Earl joined him and said, Don't fire that thing unless you have to. Maria and Kathy emerged next. Maria held her six iron as if it were a sword, and she a knight of the realm. But Kathy gripped her club by the head and held it to her chest. Dale grabbed it as she stepped by and handed it back to her in a way in which she had to grip the handle. We're going to be all right, Dale said. Tears fell down her round cheeks, but she didn't move a hand from the club to wipe them away. You don't know that, she replied. She was right, and Dale was a terrible liar. His mother once told him that a lie isn't believable unless someone wants to be lied to, and it didn't seem that Kathy was interested in having smoke, even well-intentioned smoke, blown up her ass. Why you let all them darkies walk ahead of us? Mima said to Dale as Hannah pushed her into the hall. Grandma, please. Dale hunched a bit. Those people are going to help clear your way to safety. I'd rather die than let a chink in a wetback save me. That can be arranged, Dale said. Hannah trembled at the threat and quickly pushed her grandmother down the hall. Mr. Kanye walked out of the office, then closed the office door and removed a set of keys from his pocket. What are you doing? Dale said. Locking up. Mr. Kanye paused clearly realizing how ridiculous that was. Oh. Sorry, I'm not thinking straight. No need to apologize. You're allowed a brain rattle now and again in stressful situations. Dale started walking after Hannah and Mima. I don't think stressful quite covers it, Kanye said. <laughs> Amen, brother. As Dale turned the first corner with Mr. Kanye close enough to be his shadow, he found Hannah stopped in the middle of the hallway. Dale peered around her and could see Earl down the hall. Earl brought Betsy up, then stabbed it into the corpse feeding on the dead security guard. It jolted as if a bolt of electricity coursed through its dead body. Earl pulled the blade back and quickly stuck it through an eye socket. The dead went still, then slumped over its meal. Earl knelt down and picked up the gun in the dead guard's hand. After a quick examination, he said, Crap then started searching the guard's body. It took Dale a second to realize he was looking for ammo. After a few seconds, Earl stopped and set the gun back down. Dale scanned their party. Kathy was sobbing. Maria was shaking. Mima was mumbling nonsense to herself. And Hannah was gripping the handles of the wheelchair so tight her knuckles were pearl white. Dale, Kanye said in a whisper. Did you hear that? He didn't at first. But then, there it was, a shuffling of bare feet, I think, behind us. Kanye stepped closer to Dale, his cologne as pungent as ever. Dale stepped around Kanye and went back to peer around the corner they had just turned. He could see Kanye's office door and the bodies on the floor in the hall. It was a long hall with doors on either side, lots of places to hide but what had made the noise wasn't hiding. Ten yards past Kanye's office, a man stood in the hallway. Except for a toe tag, the man wore nothing. Wrinkles and sagging skin didn't hide the Y-shaped autopsy incision, stitched up with thick, dark sutures, a stark contrast to the pale, dead skin. Its hands were by its sides, and its feet were positioned a bit wider than shoulder width. The head sporting a thin layer of salt and pepper hair, tilted slightly, eyes wide, staring, locked on Dale. Dale held his breath and waited, waited for it to move, waited for it to blink, charge, dance a jig, anything, but it didn't. It just stood there, looking at him. Dale slowly let his breath out. As he did, he got a familiar feeling, 
The feeling that he had earlier when he had put down the corpse in the hallway. The feeling that he was being watched. Not by the corpse in the hall, but by something else. A presence. It was like that irrational moment when you looked beyond yourself in a mirror, beyond your own reflection, and just for an instant, you thought you saw something looking back. Something on the other side of the mirror. A chill moved through Dale as the corpse then did something he couldn't believe. It grinned. The walking dead groaned, moaned, staggered, shuffled, and sometimes they even slobbered as they attempted to ingest copious amounts of human flesh, but never, ever, did they grin. A scream, shrill and terrifying, boomed behind Dale. He spun around so fast he knocked Kanye to the ground. Hannah frantically pulled her grandma backward, and Dale nearly collided with them. He shuffled to the side in time to see Maria swinging her golf club into an open doorway. The head of her club had swung all the way to the ground, clearly hitting nothing. Dale could not see Kathy. Following the screams, Dale and Earl got to the open door at the same time. Dale shoved Maria from the doorway and stepped inside the room. Three of the undead had Kathy sprawled out on a hospital bed. Her scrubs had been torn apart and hung threadbare on the woman as the dead went to work on her flesh. Dale got there just as teeth tore open Kathy's neck. The jugular severed, blood gushed upward, then fell back, spraying the floor. A grotesque fountain. Dale swung his club as hard as he could. The driver thumped into the skull of the dead that had just ripped out Kathy's throat. Before he could pull the club back, he heard boots sliding on linoleum. God damn it! Earl shouted. Dale turned as he pulled his driver free. Earl lay flat on his enormous back, the bottom of his boots slick with Kathy's blood. You on vacation? Dale yelled as the zombie he'd buried his club in fell to the ground. The two others were on the far side of the bed, where Earl had slipped. Both momentarily stopped tearing at Kathy's flesh to peer down at Earl. Before either of them could attack, Earl kicked at the closest one. There was a loud crack as Earl's boots snapped a knee, and the now crippled zombie fell on top of him. Earl propped the dead woman's corpse off his belly, holding her as far away as his arms would allow. Dale stepped around the bed and swung his club upward teeing off into the corpse's face. The blow snapped the zombie's head back like a Pez dispenser. It went limp. Earl pushed it off him. Dale turned, expecting the third and final zombie to be attacking, but it had gone back to feeding on Kathy's bleeding body. Dwayne burst into the room and fired a series of rounds into the zombie's body. The force of the bullet stood the corpse up and drove it back, but it did not fall. In the head, Dale said. The head! Dwayne adjusted his aim and fired. The bullet exited the head, removing a fair amount of the coroner's stitching that held its face, which had been peeled away during the autopsy in place. Once again liberated from the head, its face fell forward and hung like a bib around its neck. The body careened into a wall, then slid down the surface with a sickening sound as bare skin skidded across the decorative tiles. Dale held a hand out to Earl. You break anything? Just my pride. As Dale helped Earl up, he saw Maria in the hall. She was speaking Spanish, making the sign of the cross and backing away. And before Dale realized it, Maria backed into another open door across the hall. No, wait! Dale said, moving past Earl then stepping around Duane. Maria! Maria was several feet into the examining room across the hall before she stopped then panicked as she realized where she was. She looked to her left, and her mouth fell open. Dale stepped into the hall, intending to reach forward, grab Maria, and yank her back into the hall, but his boot got hung up on Mima's wheelchair, and he stumbled. Off balance and barreling forward, he slammed into the wall across the hall just a few feet from the doorframe. He pushed himself up in time to hear Maria scream. Then, the door slammed shut. 
Mr. Kanye was at the door a second later, his keys out. He thrust a key into the lock and twisted as Maria's cries of pain reached a fever pitch. Dale grabbed Kanye by the scruff of the neck. Open the goddamn door! Kanye just stared back at him, frozen, the gaze of a true coward. Dale snatched the keys. There were more than twenty keys on the ring. Dale picked one and tried to put it in the lock. But before he made contact with the lock, there was a loud crash from inside the room. Maria stopped screaming, and the only sounds that Dale could hear now indicated that Maria was no longer alive. Chewing. Tearing. Eating. I did the right thing, Kanye said, backing away from Dale. That's a few more we don't have to worry about. You're welcome. Kanye backed into Earl's belly. Dale took a deep breath and pushed from his mind the pleasing image of Kanye being dragged behind his 18-wheeler from here to Mississippi. Earl, did you clear these rooms when you went by? Yeah. Tapped the door frame. Took a peek. A peek? Well, we didn't go in and vacuum and dust, but we took a gander. Dwayne backed me up. Dwayne nodded. The rooms were empty. Unless... Dale turned to Dwayne. Unless what? Unless, Dwayne said. Unless they were hiding. Horse hockey, Earl said. A reanimated corpse can do some remarkable things, but hide and seek ain't in their wheelhouse. Dale looked back into the room where Kathy died. It was a moderately sized exam room, two beds, and two sets of curtains on rollers to offer patients privacy. There were no windows and no other doors. Fuck, Dale said. They were hiding. The sons of bitches were hiding. And that's when Dale realized why the zombie he had locked eyes with didn't attack. It never was going to attack. It was there to hold Dale's attention, to turn it away from the group. While he was occupied with their rear, the attack came from the sides. It was a trap. The zombies had laid a goddamn trap. Okay, Dale said. New plan. No more peeking in rooms. Kanye. On hearing his name, Mr. Kanye took a step back. Yes? When we reach a room, you lock it. Understood? Kanye nervously nodded his head. You in front with Dwayne, Mima, and Hannah in the middle. Earl and I will cover the back. Dwayne, how much further? Maybe a hundred yards to the stairwell that will take us down, unless you want to take an elevator. Dale shook his head. You never know what kind of surprise is waiting for you on the other side of an elevator door, and there's nowhere to run. Stairs, then, Dwayne said. Let's get a move on, Dale said. The new plan seemed to go well. Kanye stayed up front and locked doors every twenty to thirty feet. It was fast with the keys. If there were anything in those rooms waiting to ambush them, they'd have to be smarter than locked doors. Turning a corner, the hallway narrowed. There were only a few doors left between them and a door at the end of the hall leading to the stairs. Dwayne opened the door a crack and peeked in, then looked back at Dale. Clear. Kanye locked the last door behind them and they moved into the stairwell. It smelled of rust and old, unclean metal. Off-white paint peeled away on the steps and handrails, revealing several layers of different colors beneath. A metallic reptile, shedding several layers of skin at once. What about me, Ma? Hannah said. Dale looked at the steep, narrow steps, and then over at Dwayne. Dwayne got his meaning and immediately said, Not a chance in hell. It's your job, Mr. Kanye said. Dwayne unclipped his hospital ID from his scrubs and tossed it over the rail. I quit. Mima cackled. Don't need no help from no Nick. Shut up, Mima! Hannah shouted. We need help. I can't roll you down the damn stairs. Not waiting for instructions, Dwayne and Mr. Kanye started down the stairs, and neither of them was looking back. Dale met Earl's gaze and held up a fist. Rock, paper, scissors? Damn, Earl said and held up his fist. Ready? They both called in unison. One, two, three, shoot. Earl threw paper, 
and Dale threw a rock. God damn it, Dale said. You know what they say about good deeds? Earl said. They never go unpunished, Dale replied, stepping in front of Meemaw's chair. He hunkered down. Lean forward, Meemaw. The old woman did, and Dale threw her up on his shoulders like a sack of potatoes. Thank you, Hannah said. Let's move, Dale said, stepping down. The old woman weighed nothing. A feather pillow filled with hollow bones. The smell was not as easy to deal with. An adult diaper in need of changing was right up in his face. Dale breathed through his mouth as he took the steps in careful strides, with Hannah and Earl a step or two behind. Dale heard a door open in the stairwell below. Obviously, Duane and Kanye were not waiting for them. We gonna make it? Hannah said. Heck yeah, Earl said, scooping up the wheelchair. I feel our luck changing already. Earl, Dale snapped. My friend is superstitious, Earl said to Hannah. Just having a positive mindset, Dale, I believe it's going to be smooth sailing from here on out. And then, the lights went out. Plunged into darkness, Dale clenched his teeth. Damn it, Earl! Sorry. Nobody move, Dale said. Emergency lights should kick on in a few minutes. Although it was irrational, the darkness seemed to bring more than just a change in visibility. The air seemed colder, Mima seemed heavier, and her mumbling seemed less incoherent. Dale turned in and tried to understand what she was saying, but before he discerned anything, there was a gunshot. Christ! Dale started moving down the stairs, one hand at the metal rail attentively, like a blind man reading braille. By the time he'd reached the next level, there was a flicker of lights. The distant hum of the generators somewhere on this level echoed off the walls. In another few seconds, the light stabilized. Nowhere near as bright as the hospital's normal lighting, but better than darkness. Earl set the wheelchair down, and Dale placed Meemaw back in the saddle, trying very hard to ignore the aromatic moisture on his shoulder. Dale grabbed the handle of the stairwell door. Earl, hang back with the ladies, I'm gonna... Another two shots rang out in quick succession and then screaming. Dale moved through the door fast, bringing his golf club up like a batter at home plate. It was a wide hole. Several gurneys could move down its length side by side. The ceiling lights were dark, but where the walls met the roof, there were floodlights evenly spaced down its length, creating a series of well-illuminated spots and dark areas. He shot me! came a voice from behind Dale. Dale spun saw Kanye huddled like a child on the floor, clutching his shoulder, and knelt beside him. Let me see. Kanye shook his head and continued to keep the pressure on his wound. Dwayne shot you? Yes! Let me see. Dale reached up and moved Kanye's hand. Oh, it's just a scratch. You're not even bleeding. He is so fired. He, uh, already quit. Dale looked up and down the hallway. Where is he? They took him. They? Which way? Kanye gestured to Dale's right. There was a blood trail, sporadic but detailed. Dale could almost read the struggle in the crimson streaks and smears. He was about to follow, but suddenly felt something large looming over him. Hey, Earl, thought I told you to wait in the stairwell. I got bored. You know my short attention span. Well, fair enough. Dale stood and traced the blood trail with his gaze. You three, wait here. Earl and I are going for a walk. He's dead, Kanye said. Let's just get to the morgue. If it had been you dragged down the hall, I'm sure you'd want someone to check on you, Dale said. But by all means, feel free to continue on your own. We'll be right here, Hannah said. Mima cackled and hacked up mucus. With Betsy and the golf club at the ready, Earl and Dale moved down the hall each with one eye on the blood trail and the other cast as far forward as the backup emergency lights allowed. Their footfalls on the floor were near silent, an effect they had mastered through more practice than either would like to remember. If I had a dollar for every blood trail we followed down a perfectly civilized hallway, Earl muttered. You could afford to buy a decent truck, Dale finished. Leave my wheels out of this. Dale stepped over a blood streak, clearly made from a flailing hand. Red-soaked digits on white linoleum. So, 
Best man, huh? Yes, sir, Earl said, sidestepping a metal tray and clipboard on the floor. Well, check my recall, but that is a first for you, I think. I would have liked to have been best man at your wedding, but you didn't invite nobody. Oh, sorry about that. When you're marrying crazy, you don't exactly want to share it with the world. Nail brought a finger to his lips, and the two men fell silent. Ten feet ahead, the hallway turned to the right, and so did the blood trail. The two men approached the corner. Dale took a peek. The lighting wasn't as good compared to the passage they had come down, but it didn't need to be. He could see Duane, or at least what was left of him. Three ravenous corpses knelt around his limp body, tearing out organs and breaking off bone. Blood-soaked hospital gowns hung loosely on the zombies like tattered curtains. The floor around the scene was no longer white, but a pool of crimson. That's the thing about blood trails, Burl said. There's never anything pretty at the end of them. No, Dale said. Let's make this fast. The two men rushed forward, Club and Betsy swinging. Before any of the dead even noticed them coming, their heads had been cracked open like walnuts. They all fell forward on top of Duane's body, a grotesque dog pile of death. Dale searched the scene and found what he'd come for. He knew Duane was dead, but it was the gun he wanted. It was still in Duane's hand. He grabbed it by the muzzle, pulled it free, and wiped it free of gore on the backside of a hospital gown. The owner of the gown didn't seem to mind. How are we looking? Earl said. Dale checked the ammo. Shit. One left. That was hardly worth the walk. You got plans for it? If it comes to it... I'll save it for Hannah. Well, you're quiet, the gentleman. What about the other two? Dale started walking back. I'd gladly strangle the both of them, whether it comes to it or not. They turned the corner and could see the others right where they left them. Let's just stick to plan A, Earl said. Getting the hell out of here. Yep. Besides, I want to live long enough to see you in a tux. Well, who invited you to the wedding? I got the invite same time as you, dumbass. Why didn't you say nothing? I don't have to share my social calendar with you. Social calendar? The only things on your calendar are Jesus' birthday and the Super Bowl. Well, now I got three things. Kanye was on his feet when Dale and Earl met up. All right, Mr. Kanye, Dale said. It's up to you to show us the way. Kanye stood up a bit straighter, stopped putting pressure on the wound that wasn't a wound, and said, Okay, follow me. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by HelloFresh. Get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. With all the excitement of eating out and all the satisfaction of preparing a world-class meal yourself, HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking fun, easy, and affordable. But first and foremost, HelloFresh's recipes are delicious. With fresh, high-quality ingredients delivered every week for a super flavorful experience that is 90% sourced directly from growers right to your kitchen. And it never gets stale, so to speak. With so many recipes to choose from each week to help you break out of your recipe rut, the efficiency of HelloFresh's pre-portioned ingredients means there's less prep for you and less food waste boasting a carbon footprint 25% lower than store-brought grocery-made meals. And as great as all that is, the bottom line is that HelloFresh is just fun, providing an entertaining and highly satisfying activity for the whole family, keeping your fridge stocked, and offering the flexibility of changing delivery days, food preferences, or even skipping a week whenever you need. You can save up to 28% by using HelloFresh versus your grocery store shopping trips. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. I personally could not love HelloFresh enough. As a matter of fact, as I am recording this, I am currently digesting a Shrewman Swiss pork burger with potato wedges and a creamy honey Dijon dipper that was savory and perfect and truly every bit as good as it sounds, and I had a really amazing time cooking it. It's made me so confident about my own cooking. I just, I couldn't enjoy it more. 
So stop wasting time. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 80Hill and use code 80Hill, that's 80HILL, to get a total of $80 off, including free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions apply. Please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. Remember that promo code 80Hill. It is absolutely worth it. And thanks again for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. The five of them moved down the hall the opposite direction from where Duane had been dragged. As they turned the corner, a body lay on the floor. Blood pooled around the corpse dressed in faded green hospital scrubs. Kanye sidestepped it, and everyone followed. Everyone, except Dale. Dale hung back and poked the body with his golf club. Then, hooking the shoulder with his boot, he rolled it onto its back. The dead doctor, or nurse, was male, black, and had its throat torn open. He had bled out pretty quickly. His hands were soaked with his own blood, and Dale imagined him trying to keep pressure on the wound. A quick scan from head to toe revealed no other wounds. Strange. The zombie didn't eat their kill, Dale thought. Interesting. He looked back up the hall and saw Earl, a look of impatience on his face, holding open a door. You need a personal invitation? Don't get your panties in a bunch, Dale said. I'm coming. Earl stepped to the door that had the word more stenciled on it and lingered while Dale joined him. You find something interesting? Maybe, Dale said, more to himself than to Earl. Dale had been in his fair share of morgues, but this was by far the largest he'd ever seen. At least fifty feet across and more autopsy tables than could be counted in a quick glance. Vertical freezers lined one wall with many of the long steel drawers open, revealing no occupants. Near the entrance, a body lay face down on the floor. Dale squatted near its hips and rolled it over. The body was male, wearing pale gray hospital scrubs. Its eyes were still open dark brown, and its head was slumped at an odd angle. A gold chain had come loose and was draped across its face. A six-pointed star still attached to the broken chain was partially embedded into the man's cheek. Dale searched for a wound, and when he couldn't immediately find one, he checked the neck. Broken. Add that to the list of things zombies don't do. Dale closed the man's eyes and stood then joined the others. Kanye led everyone to the very back of the room where he paused in front of a large steel shelf unit on wheels. Give me a hand, he said to Earl. Earl stepped over and together they rolled the shelf away from the wall, revealing an opening. It was clear that there had been some sort of door covering the opening, but had been removed long ago. Rust filled the holes in the door frame that marked the area where the hinges had been. Kanye stepped inside momentarily disappearing into darkness. Then, lights flickered to life. Dale stepped close to the opening and peeked in. It wasn't what he'd expected. It was a steam tunnel, all right. Furnaces, big and round, took up most of the floor space around the opening. They appeared to be in a state of disuse, and Dale figured they hadn't been turned on in decades. Steam pipes ran along the tunnel's length, and a makeshift lighting system had been installed. And Kanye knew instantly how to turn them on. Kanye looked back at everyone, and Dale narrowed his gaze at him. The lights? Runs on a separate battery system, Kanye said. Not part of the hospital system. You seem to know your way around here for someone who forbids people to come down here, Earl said. Off limits to everyone else, Dale said. He pointed down the tunnel. How far does it go? All the way to the outskirts of the next town. Honeywell Springs. Kanye waved everyone to follow. They moved through the passage and Dale could see that up ahead, a new tunnel had been created. It veered to the north and used the same non-hospital lights as the steam tunnel. This new tunnel didn't look like an emergency escape route for patients. It had walls of earth and railroad ties for supports. It was not the first of its kind Dale had seen. It was all too familiar. When they reached the new northbound tunnel, Kanye held his hand out in a polite gesture, ushering Hannah and Mima inside. 
Such a gentleman, Dale thought. So, Mr. Kanye, what are you smuggling? Prescription drugs? Kanye looked like a man that was too damn tired to make up more lies. Nothing that mundane. Earl scrunched his chin. What then? Dale took a stab at it. Organs. Kanye started walking down the passage. Our morgue is the largest in the state. So many bodies pass through here and you would not believe how many of them don't have their organ donor cards filled out. It's a shame that all those life-saving organs just get sent off to the crematorium while patients die on waiting lists. So you provide a public service, Dale said, to those that can afford it. Earl scowled. Rich folks don't feel the need to wait in line like everyone else. Kanye looked back at them. I don't give a damn about the economic inequities and all this. What do you give a damn about? Dale said. That I have three kids in college, and that a hospital administrator, even the head of billing, doesn't pay as well as I thought it would. Jeez, Earl said. Everybody's got an angle. Everybody and their dog, Dale said. Lead on, Mr. Kanye. Kanye stepped in front of Mimo and Hannah and motioned everyone to follow. If we keep a steady pace, we should be there in about 18 minutes. You think we're gonna be able to slip under M.I.G.'s quarantine zone? Earl said. Dale lowered his voice. It's a long shot. But even if we slip the noose, our lives will be very different going forward. How do you mean? Captain Major ain't gonna let this lie. He'll come after us. And with his resources... Damn. Out of the frying pan. Into the fire. Dale finished. But on the bright side, I have noticed that in the past hour, your mood has improved. Mostly since Dale snapped his fingers and grinned. Since you found out that M.I.G. intended to nail the lid shut on our coffins. Do you have a point? Earl's voice sounded noticeably irritated. Yes, I do. Get on with it! Earl snapped. You're not upset about Jojo getting married to a man. Of course not! Earl said. I'm not an idiot! I love that kid! I know you do, but you're scared. And what scares you the most? What's made you so damn irritable for the past week? And what caused your lack of focus this morning? Which is what sent us to this damn hospital in the first place? The whole reason we are even in this fix is... It's what? It's what you'll have to do if we survive this mess. Earl sighed. Gone. Oh. You're going to have to stand up in front of everyone you know, everyone you love, hell, your entire tribe, and give the best man speech. I know. Earl's shoulders slumped. And I'm terrified. Of what? You know I'm not good with birds. I don't want to look like a fool, Earl said. Not in front of Jojo. I couldn't handle that. All the guys will be screaming in hell, Mima said her shrill voice echoing down the tunnel. When Damon fire, old woman, will you shut the hell up? Earl snapped. Dale stepped closer to his friend and put an arm around his shoulders. You can be pretty thick sometimes. Earl shrugged him off. Thanks for your support. What I mean is, it doesn't matter what you say or how you say it. What are you talking about? Dale laughed. <laughs> Earl... You mean the world to that kid. Your father figure, older brother, role model, and weird uncle all rolled up into one. And there is no speech, good or bad, that's going to change that. Yeah. Well, I guess you're... All immoral deviants will suffer the pain that they got coming, Meemaw said. Damn it! Earl said, then leaned down near Meemaw's ear. Not one more word out of your demented mouth. You feeling me, Aunt B? The woman fell silent. Earl stepped back and took a deep breath. Dale chuckled. What is so damn funny? You, Dale said, scared to death of a speech. Hey, I'll have you know that public speaking is the number one fear. Death is number two. Dale nodded. I know, and it does explain a lot. Dale let another chuckle slip. I was once a gay, Mima said. I knew the love and intimate touch of woman. Mima, please be quiet, 
Anna said. Now hold the phone, Earl said, rushing forward and placing a hand on Hannah's shoulder. I think Mayma wants to tell a story. Let's not interrupt. Everyone seemed to lean a little closer to Mima as they walked. Even Mr. Kanye turned an ear back to listen. It was 1945. The boys were coming home from the war, and the factories we had kept running with our blood and sweat were firing all the women. Most went quietly back to being the homemakers they wanted to be. I was one of them. But not Esther. No, sir. The foreman had to beat her and throw her out to make her leave. I saw it happen. I took her home, stripped her naked, and nursed her wounds. She was a sight to behold. Rosie the Riveter wasn't fit to be her shadow. She was a great goddess, sculpted by heaven. We made love that night, and she touched me like no man ever could, or ever has. Wow, Dale said. Did not see that coming. What am I tortured so I knew it was wrong, Mima said. Even my beloved Esther will be torn apart by the agents of the devil. Revelations. Hellfire will consume the impure. The blacks, the chinks, the wetbacks, the Jews will be torn asunder. Back to our regularly scheduled program, Earl mumbled. Mima, enough, Hannah said, then turned back to Dale and Earl. I know it's not an excuse, but Mima's head is out of sorts. It's gotten real bad last couple years, with the dementia. I'm not sure she knows what she's saying. So she wasn't always racist, Dale said. Um, no, that is not what I mean. She is, big time. It's just that she used to be not as outspoken in mixed company. So, more of a polite racist, Dale said. You can roll a zebra around in the mud to hide its stripes, but eventually the mud's gotta come off, Earl said. I guess, Hannah said. Dale glanced at Mima. She had gone back to mumbling to herself and didn't seem to give a rat's fart that people were talking about her. She was beyond caring what people said or thought. Maybe it was old age. Maybe it was dementia. Or maybe... Maybe it was something. Except for Mima's mumbling, they walked in silence for the next ten minutes, and Dale was thankful for the quiet. He had a lot to sort out. Kanye turning out to be an organ smuggler was one of the only things about the last twelve hours that did make sense. The list of things that didn't make sense seemed to be longer than his arm, and at the very top of that list, Dale held the image of a corpse locking eyes with him and grinning. Just as Dale got an idea one that might explain what was going on, Kanye said, We're here. Kanye quick stepped to an iron rail gate. He pulled it inward then grabbed two handles that were attached to a plywood wall. He seemed to be struggling, so Earl stepped forward and helped him slide it to the left. Fresh air from outside rushed in, smelling of pine. Less than a minute later, they all stood under a night sky. Hannah shivered a little in the chilly pre-dawn air. Dale looked up at the stars and breathed deeply for the first time in a long while. Before Dale had exhaled, blinding floodlights hit the small group, seemingly from every conceivable angle. That is far enough, Captain Major said through a bullhorn. Hey, Captain, that you? Dale said, knowing damn well that it was. Bringing a hand up to his face, he was able to make out at least a dozen silhouettes in the night. He didn't need to spy the details to know that they were wearing state-of-the-art zombie hazmat suits, a blending of Kevlar and lightweight chainmail, the kind in shark suits, and armed with a mix of military-grade M4A1 carbine and lightweight flamethrowers. You get points for trying, but you know how this has to end. Dale took a deep breath and hoped he wasn't wrong. Yes, sir, I do. But I think you owe it to yourself to at least hear my report. A figure stepped forward and went from silhouette to a six-foot-tall, square-jawed man with a razor-sharp crew cut, wearing a suit that looked dated but definitely gray. You can't talk yourself out of this, Captain Major said, the bullhorn at his side. Not trying to, Dale said, holding up three fingers. Scout's honor. I doubt you were ever a scout, but you got two minutes. Thank you. 
But first, do you currently have eyes on any of the infected inside of the quarantine zone? Captain Major pulled a walkie-talkie from his inside jacket pocket to press the call button. Sergeant, are you monitoring infected movement? Yes, sir. I've got nine on the south entrance, four on the lawn, and over a dozen in the parking lot. Do you need a clearing? Tell them to just keep an eye on them, and don't look away, Dale said. Sergeant, maintain observation status and stand by. Copy that. Okay, Dale, Captain Major said. You got some trick up your sleeve? I'd like to see it. So would I, Earl said. It took me a bit to reckon all this, but I think I got a handle on it now. You said yourself, Captain, that this one was different. I admit this one is outside normal parameters. 45 seconds. Tomato, tomato. Truth is, this outbreak doesn't fit normal parameters because it isn't an outbreak. It has been made to look like one, though. Dale stepped slowly to his right, mindful that firearms were aimed at his head. I need evidence, Captain Major said. 35 seconds. The evidence I got is pretty much circumstantial. Dale continued to walk slowly, making no sudden moves. He was circling the small group of survivors. It's more about behavior. Observation. Nothing you could have figured out in the lab. 25 seconds. I appreciate keeping an eye on the time, Dale said, nearing Earl. It's not at all distracting. My pleasure. 20 seconds. So like I said, behavior, not so much what they have been doing, but more what they haven't been doing. And who they haven't been doing it to. You don't know this about me, Dale, but I hate riddles. 15 seconds. I beg your pardon. Dale said, standing close to Earl. The only way to prove this to you is to show you. Now, Captain, please try not to react. Just watch. Whatever it is you're going to show me, now is the time. Ten seconds. Earl looked at Dale and his expression seemed to say, I hope to hell you know what you're doing. Dale gave him his best me too glance. Five seconds. With lightning speed, Dale reached down and withdrew the pistol tucked in Earl's belt. He pivoted on a booted heel and placed the muzzle to Meemaw's forehead. Hannah screamed, No! Dale fired, sending the back of the old woman's head into Hannah's crotch. Chunks of crimson, brain, and skull decorated Hannah from knees to tits, and she screamed. Dale let the gun fall and threw his hands in the air as weapons took aim. Now everybody, hold on! Dale had to shout over Hannah's screams as the red dots of laser scopes covered his body. Everybody, hold the phone one second! He met the captain's perplexed glare. Check it, Captain! Check it! Captain Major slowly brought up the walkie. Sergeant, status update. Holy shit, Captain. They all just did a phantom menace! Captain Major's perplexed look did not abate. Come again, Sergeant? Sorry, sir. They all just dropped. The walking corpse is all down. No movement. Captain Major took a deep breath and looked hard at Dale. Dale smiled the friendliest smile he could muster. One that hopefully said, Please don't shoot me. Sergeant, I want confirmation. Send squads into the quarantine. Full suits. Report back. Roger that. How? Captain Major said. Dale took a breath and lowered his hands. Necromancy? The old woman was a necromancer in the early stages of dementia, and I don't know what stage of racism, but she was not going to win any multicultural unity awards, that's for darn sure. Necromancer, Captain Major said. Never came across one before. I would have liked to interview her. Dale shrugged. Sorry. Captain Major glanced over his shoulder and raised his hand. Stand down! Dale looked over at Earl and saw the red dots disappear. You okay, big guy? Earl added a breath that he'd obviously been holding. I need a change of britches. More than 48 hours later, Dale staggered out of a very nondescript building. MIG had put him through vigorous decontamination, probing, interrogating, more probing, and even more decontaminating. 
Although Dale's reasoning had been sound, MIG wasn't taking any chances. Their job was to prevent, at any cost, an outbreak of the undead like the one in 68. And except for a few that got loose in Africa and the former Soviet Union, they'd been pretty successful. Dale wasn't sure what time it was, but looking at the sun through squinted eyes, he judged it to be mid-morning. Hey, ugly, Earl said from across the parking lot, wearing the same gray-colored zip-up onesie that Dale had been issued after the clothes had been incinerated. Earl was leaning on his truck, the Peterbilt, that he was as proud of as a little girl with her first mud pie. When you get out, Dale said, making his way toward his friend and bringing a hand up to shield his eyes from the sun. Round sunrise, Earl said. Why do they hold you so long? Spite, I imagine. Captain Major didn't seem all that happy that he didn't get to blow something up. Well, that's understandable, Earl said, tossing Dale a Mac Tools ball cap. Dale snatched it and quickly put it on. Thanks. But I tell you what, they spritz parts of me I haven't seen in ages. I ain't been this clean since... Well, well, I don't know when. Dale reached the trunk. You smell like disinfectant. Dale took a whiff of his right armpit. Mm, me too. <laughs> clean as a whistle. Dale leaned against the door. You see the other two come out? Earl nodded. Mr. Kanye came out with me. He didn't say much other than I didn't have to worry about any bills from the hospital. What a generous son of a bitch. It was as close to a thank you as I was going to get, so I took it. You see the girl, Hannah? Yep. Wandered out an hour ago. You know, it skips a generation. Y'all have words? That is one of the few things about necromancy that I do know, Earl said. And yes, we had words. He explained both sides of the coin to her, gave her our card, told her she needed help with the dreams, finding some control, help with any of that to give us a holler, We put her in touch with people, good people that can help. Then the flip side, Earl nodded, and also said if we catch wind of her following in Meemaw's footsteps that we'd be calling on her. Did you make an impression? Like an elephant on a pogo stick, Earl said. Hey! That reminds me, you don't often make an impression on me, but I gotta hand it to you. You rolled out your big boy brain on this one. How the hell did you figure out what was going on? Don't be so impressed, Dale said. If I were a lot smarter, I'd have figured it out faster. First tip-off was the dead. Even you noticed they were different. Not until you pointed it out, sorry to say. Earl folded his arms. They staggered, moaned, and ate human flesh, just as expected. I think that was just for show, especially the eating flesh part, Dale said. I found bodies that hadn't been chewed on. Old Mima was making it look like a rising to keep the suspicion away from her. Crafty old hag, Earl said. Controlling the dead, seeing through their eyes, takes a lot of control, even for a seasoned necromancer. I'm sure me and Ma had that control at one time. Probably hid her gift, just used it when it suited her. We'll never know. But what I do know is that her dementia did her mental control no favors, and it let the old time bigotry out to play. It was who the dead went after, and didn't go after, that made it click in my mind. When I realized her mumbling wasn't mumbling at all, but incantations. Well, there you go, I guess. Raising the dead, dementia, racism does not make for a fun evening. Earl got a very uncomfortable look on his face. You okay? It's just... Mm. Earl took a deep breath. Not sure I know how to feel knowing that the reason I survived is because of the color of my skin. Can't really feel one way or another about the cards you draw in life. I guess it's all in how you play them. Earl groaned. I think I have given you my opinion more than once on how I feel about your cards analogy. <laughs> yes, you have, Dale said. How about this? If you and I ever become mindless flesh-eating zombies, we solemnly swear to eat folks of all colors, nationalities, and religions. And sexual persuasion? Earl added. Sure enough, Dale said. 
a smorgasbord of adversity. Amen, Earl said with a chuckle. Now, let's get the hell out of here. I hear that, Dale said. And we need to get to the business of finding you a tux. Don't remind me, Earl said. How about a drink first? It's not even noon, Earl. Well, as the song goes, it's five o'clock somewhere. You've been listening to The Greatest Fear by author Kevin David Anderson. So good to see my old friends Dale and Earl ride off into the sunset again. You think they'll live happily ever after? <laughs> I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Horror Hill. Don't forget to tune in again next week when I yet again regale you with a handful of tales to terrify, plumbed from the most depraved depths of the human imagination. Tonight's episode featured a tale from the very talented Kevin David Anderson. The Greatest Fear was written by and presented courtesy of Kevin David Anderson. Anderson's debut novel, The Geeky Cult Zombie Rom, Night of the Living Trekkies, is a funny, offbeat novel exploring the pop culture carnage that ensues when the undead crash a Star Trek convention. His latest book, Midnight Men, The Supernatural Adventures of Earl and Dale, sound familiar, was inspired by the short story Green Eyes and Chili Dogs, produced by yours truly, Jason Hill and heard on my own YouTube channel and on the Simply Scary Podcast Season 3, Episode 6. Anderson's stories have appeared in over a hundred publications and on fantastic podcasts such as The Drabblecast, Pseudopod, The No Sleep Podcast, Horror Hill, and The Simply Scary Podcast. In addition, he's an active member of the Horror Writers Association, and currently works in special education. For more information on him, visit kevindavidanderson.com. If you enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the horror hill for yet another dance with darkness, I bid you good night, sleep tight, listener, and whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. <laughs>
Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda, Luke Hodgkinson, and Jesse Cornett. Final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshak. The program's artwork by yours truly, Jason Hill. Logo by Craig Groshak. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. (laughs) 